So after the general overview on different approaches to arrival times, I will now go through the different schemes and give you a bit, little bit more of the, of the theoretical background of the mathematical tools, actually, the language that you use to actually work with these guys. Now, the, the first of these that I, that I presented before is the covariant approach. So we have, we, we assume that we know what the time evolution of the system is. And then we look at an operator valued measure, right? So that is uh, F of M would be an operator and would be a bounded operator on the system Hilbert space, right? And it would be between zero and one. So that's why it's a positive operator valued measure. And in the argument, M would actually be a subset of R, which we interpret as a time axis. So actually the expectation value of this operator in some state would be interpreted as the probability to register that the detector clicks during the set of times given by M. So M would be, I think in the previous video, it was just a time interval. But then if you have several such intervals, you can add up these operators. And so that's the, op uh, the, the operator property. Now the, the covariance property just says that this kind of um, probability distribution transforms correctly under the time evolution. So it says this, right? so the UT star, UT, uh, this is what like measuring after a time shift, that just shifts the distribution. Where this set of times is every element in that set shifted by the same time. So you just shift the interval in this way. Okay, so this is the covariance condition, and uh, just to name a few people who, who have this, so I will mention Jerzy Kijowski. 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 He was one of the first to do something like that. Um, you will find it in a textbook by Ludwig, and you'll find it in the works of Alexander Hollywood. Um So for actually for Hollywood, it was the question, suppose, um, somebody has made an, an arbitrary shift in the time shift of my, of my quantum state um, and I have a detector and I, I'm supposed to find out what the time shift was. Well, actually making an arrival time measurement is a good strategy to do that. You just put your detector there and if it clicks later then you make an inf infer something about the time shift. So his paper is called something like estimating shift parameters. Right? So from that point of view, it's also natural to not insist on projection valuedness. Um, so these things exist. And so actually, um, I, I have to say that uh, F is far from unique. That is, given the time evolution. Right? And it shouldn't be unique because you actually want to talk about the arrival at a certain kind of detector or at the occurrence of a certain event, whatever that may be, right? So, but typically it's just a detection event. And um, then there are very many different kinds of detector for your kind of system and they have different Fs, right? So, so you expect this to be highly non-unique. Actually, in the classical case, it's very obvious that it would be highly non-unique. But what we can do actually is to make a general construction of these guys. So, um, um, and that will be the next plot. So let's see how to construct a general covariant arrival time. Right? So the two two steps. The first step is dilate. Um, I'll explain exactly what that means, but it's, it's sort of in a, a general circle of ideas, of ideas. Some people say, you go to the church of the larger Hilbert space, and that's what we're going to do. And uh, so this is a covariant version. Of the Neymar dilation theorem. I'll explain that in a, in a, in a minute. So actually the Neymark dilation theorem is something that turns general positive operator value measure into projection value once on a larger Hilbert space. 
And uh, this is actually a special case of Steinspring's dilation theorem. And for that also, the, the remark here is that these constructions are natural or canonical, which means that if you have a symmetry at the level or have you an isomorphism at the, at the level of the original object, then this automatically transports to an isomorphism of the dilated object, or the thing on the larger Hilbert space. And we'll see how this plays out. And uh, so, but this is, so this is a property of this whole construction. So actually, you, in some sense, you don't have to do any additional work, right? Now, this first step, also for general covariant observables, uh, different groups, uh, and so on, you can do the same thing. And then you have to solve for the for the for the projection diagonal case, right? So the second is um, well, in, this, in our case, it's used for Neumann's for Neumann's uniqueness theorem. So this is actually a specialization of what you do in a in a case of a general group. There, you have to characterize what Mackey calls systems of imprimitivity, and that is covered by the theory of induced representations that he developed for the locally compact groups. So, um, so also there, there is general construction. So we're just specializing this general construction to, the, to, to this particular kind of covariance, let me covariance with respect to time shifts. Okay, so what does the dilation step mean? The dilation step means so that means you find the following object. So you, you have your original Hilbert space with a covariant observable. Then out of that, you make another Hilbert space. And these dilated objects just get a hat. Right? So you construct hat, H hat, hat. You also construct a dilated version of the time evolution. This is the part of where the symmetry also lifts to the extended structure. And uh, you have... Um, um, an observable, and this is a projection valued and covariant projection valued. UT hat covariant. Now, um, and, and of course you have to relate them. One way to say this is that H hat is an extended Hilbert space. This is the story of going to the church of the larger Hilbert space. But you can also just say that you have an operator that maps your given Hilbert space to the larger one and it sort of makes an isomorphic copy inside the larger one. So this is an isometry. And um, so this is isometric. And uh, now the, the way the original objects are related, first of all, this is an intertwining operator for the time evolutions. Yeah, so that's this relation. And in order to get the original um, observable back, um, you just project back down onto the given Hilbert space. Okay, so um, so this is the dilation step. Actually, if you just leave out the, anything related to covariance and the unitary group, what I just wrote down is called Neumark's dilation theorem. That was one of the first dilation theorems. Um, but now, actually, it's it's easy to show that or to 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 verify that this construction nat naturally has the property that the unitary symmetry at the f level becomes a symmetry at the hatted level. Right, so at the, at the dilated level. Now, what we have here now, um, so it's uh, it's ut hat covariant, this observable. Now that means that it it everything I said in the very first overview lecture, um, namely about uh, Pauli's argument, now is true. Right for this guy, it's actually uh, just a basic pair of canonical variables, right? And this is the part of von Neumann's uniqueness theorem. For other groups, you have to different characterization theorems that you have to use for the induced representations. Okay, so for the second step, we now just have to compute all the projection valued solutions. And that is much easier because there's more structure, right? So, um, so and this happens in general. 
So uh, for general groups and corresponding covariance conditions, um, this is computing induced representations in the sense of Mackey. Now, in our particular case, this is covered by von Neumann's uniqueness theorem for the CCR, for the canonical commutation relations. And uh, that means that we can just assume that up to, or the, it's true that up to unitary transformation, which doesn't matter here anyway, the Hilbert space is the following. Right? It's the square integrable function on the real line interpreted as the timeline. So this is why I write integration variable dt. And I write a semicolon here for the functions with values in another Hilbert space k. So this would be like the, you can call it the multiplicity space or the set of internal, additional internal degrees of freedom. Um, and this, this, this space is known to be isomorphic to, to just the tensor product of the R2 space of the timeline with k. Right? So, but I, I prefer for this, for the purposes here, to think of this as k-valued functions. Um, okay, so um, then we have to give the, the observable. So if I take f hat of some set, apply that to a vector, this is like the position operator. So at a point p, uh, so this is just equal to psi of t. if t is an element of m, so we are just multiplying with the indicator function, and, uh, and it's equal to zero otherwise. Right, so this is exactly like uh, the position observable when we place t by position. And the the unitary time evolution for this is just a shift. The u is a shift, so ut at, let's say, well, for a shift parameter s, apply to psi, at point t is just psi of t minus s. So these are all vector valued, k valued uh, equations, but otherwise that's, that's just a standard form of it. So now we, we just have to find these, these intertwining operators with the standard uh, position momentum uh, position pair. And from that, we get all the possible uh, covariant observables. And I'll give an example of a free type motion next. So let us just apply what the construction that I just gave um, to the case of a free particle. So we know what the Hamiltonian is there, like p squared over 2n. And uh, so it's a straightforward question to can construct all the uh, covariant observables for that. But I'm, I'm focusing on one. And the first who gave this construction was uh, Piotrowski. And that was uh, in 1973. And you'll get a link to the paper. So. Um, so now the, the, we know the, what the spectrum of the, of the free time evolution is. So it's just a positive axis, right? So, um, and the spectrum is absolutely continuous. Now we have to solve this, uh, this intertwining relation. So this is just the shift, right? So this is, has absolutely continuous spectrum from minus infinity to plus infinity. So this has uh, so this has absolutely absolutely continuous spectrum equal to R, and this has um, uh, absolutely continuous spectrum equal to R plus with double multiplicity because. The energy has double multiplicity. Uh, big, uh, momentum is simple, right? So there's also, for, for energy, you have to also distinguish the sign of the momentum. Uh, they, they would have the same, P and minus P have the same energy, right? So with double uh, multiplicity. So what this, what the V then looks like, so um, V psi, 
uh, is now a function of the energy and uh, and also of s where this is this this moment the sign of momentum Or you could also say this is a spin of variables that has two, two components. And this is supposed to be just the same as uh, the wave function. I leave a little space here. Or let's say there's a function that depends on the energy. Put it here. And there is a, this is just the wave function for the corresponding momentum. So actually, S is the sign of the momentum. Um, so that we take the momentum space wave function here. And the momentum, uh, this, let's say the, the, the Hamiltonian is uh, p squared over 2m. So the energy is just, oh, that's the energy. So, so the energy is just the square root of 2m times e. OK? So this is the, this is the momentum space wave function. So that is how you how you solve this intertwining relation, and uh, the, the factor here, well, actually you can play with that a little bit. Also, I'm, I'm just using single multiplicity for this uh, for this dilated version, um, and we one could, would, could do other things, right? So so also this this could be again this could be sort of vector valued, but let us just stick to stick to the simple case, simplest case as Piotrowski did. Um, then this is the basic transformation, and now we know exactly how u hat and f hat act on that level, and um, I've given you everything, right? Now, okay, we can we could comp compute that, but rather than doing that in in detail, so of course this this has to be um, um, adjusted. Basically, of course, you have like a nonlinear transformation of the positive energy to the positive momentum axis. And so there's a function of determinant involved, right? So adjust so that uh, V star V is one. It's a function of determinant. It's, it's, it's uh, something like uh, root M over P or something like that. Okay, so, um, so you just put exactly the factor in that makes this isometric. If you just write out the integral, from your substitution, you get the, the what the factor should be. Okay, so what what happens here? Um, now, one let let me compare this uh, with another approach you might have to arrival times. So, rather than describing doing all the details of the computation here, let me describe sort of what happens here. Um, so let's say we look at the arrival at the origin, and then we could look at one way of thinking about arrival times would be to say, well, we're looking at the probability current, the usual thing, which is something like 1 over m times the imaginary part of psi bar. Well, you're looking at the origin, right? And then we take psi prime also at the origin. And that would be something like the probability current. And um, so this would be, if you write it as an integral of a, the momentum variable, um, you you do something like this. You take the imaginary part has a factor of one half. So this is you're integrating the two wave functions. Ah, this, this is sorry. This is this is position space wave function, right? So um, so maybe I I should say the Fourier transform before psi was the momentum space wave function. So now we may take Fourier transform. So we have the position space wave function. So the Fourier transform at zero is just the integral, and the derivative gives just an additional factor p, basically. And the imaginary part here is actually ip, so the imaginary part gives you something like that, um, psi of p prime. Okay. Now, if you if you look at this expression, the probability this this would be something like something like the probability density for a rival. But it's clearly not positive. Right? This, this kernel here is not a positive definite kernel, and that is you easily find examples of wave functions where the arrival probability is negative. This is sometimes called the backflow phenomenon. So this is, uh, so this is the probability current kind of approach, which is actually often used for this kind of arrival problem. Right? 
Um, and but it has this 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 principal problem that if you want to interpret this as a probability density, you have a problem. Now, what the Kiyoski co construction does uh, is effectively a play, replacing this thing here. So we are effectively replacing this kernel, which is not positive definite and therefore won't describe a probability, to by so this is like one over n times the arithmetic mean of the momenta. And we replace this by the geometric mean. So we take the root of the absolute value of p times p prime and divide by m. Replace by, right? If you do that, it's clear that, that what you get here has the chance of being a probability distribution. Um, that would be another way to approach this problem, but actually it just comes out of this computation, right? So if you if you just do this computation, I told you it's basically completely characterized by this formula, then um, this is what you get, okay? So that, that is this particular example. One general remark about the covariant time observables comes again from, so let me just write down again the, the intertwining relation. Now, this, this operator that comes from just a shift on the real line, so this has absolutely continuous spectrum. And therefore, an anything that is sort of a subspace of that would also have absolutely continuous spectrum. So it's only possible if ut, uh, that is the same as saying h, um, has absolutely continuous spectrum. Which is to say, if you take a subset of the of the energy spectrum and you look at and which has measure zero, the big measure zero, um, and you compute the corresponding spectral projection, you get zero. That that is the statement of absolutely continuous spectrum. In other words, discrete spectrum is very bad. If you just have eigenvalues, that's very bad. Right? So you can't get this sort of intertwining operator because just that's how the spectral measures don't behave. So, for example, for a harmonic oscillator that has purely discrete spectrum, you don't find any covariant observables. That is just as well, though, because, uh, I mean, remember what the relation said, like this, right? But if you take for t a whole period, this operator, ut, is actually minus 1 or the, the whole thing is equal to f of m again. So if you take an, an, a time interval that is shorter than the period, you just keep it. They, they all have to be the same. So we, they never add up to anything finite. Right? So you can't have a normalized arrival time measure for the harmonic oscillator simply because this thing keeps repeating. And the, the same, so the harmonic oscillator is special because then the ut is actually equal to the identity sometimes. But uh, even any case of, of, of dis just discrete eigenvalues or actually of singular continuous spectrum um, would just forbid the existence of these things. We have to discuss what that means. I mean, what it, that, the, I, am I really saying here that there's no notion of arrival time for harmonic oscillators? I mean, I can just sit in the center and wait until the pendulum swings by, right? Can't I? So um, we'll have to discuss that. But but this this in this covariant approach, this is a clear result of the general construction. You simply don't have these guys in discrete or singular continuous spectrum. Okay, so let me discuss time operators. Right? Now we have the time uh, the, the operators that give you the probabilities for some time intervals. But what is the time operator now? And uh, so, of course, the probability distribution that I get when I take such a measurement, so, so this is uh, the probability for arrival, for de uh, arrival or detection or whatever, uh, arrival in M, right? So the arrival time of be in that interval. 
or that's the subset for now. So this is a probability distribution. Of course, it has moments, right? So you can I can look at the mean arrival time. So the mean arrival time would clearly be just this integral, right? So it is the the integral uh, p dt. That's all my integration with the probability, and you just integrate the variable t. Right? So this is the mean of this probability. And uh, that would be just the trace of rho. And then here is an operator valued integral, f dt t. And let me just call this guy t. So capital T. So this is so this is the mean arrival operator. You can clearly do that. Um, and so this is some, some kind of an operator which actually has the right commutation relations with the energy, right? So it's like phonologically conjugate, but it's, uh, I have to warn you, it's usually not self adjoint. Uh, I'll, I'll discuss in more detail what, what kind of beast that is, right? So, but it is it is an operator, all right. It has some dense domain. It's an unbounded operator, typically, of course. Um, so, so I can um, I can just use that to compute the mean arrival time. There's something else I could do. Um, I could also look at something that I call t bracket square, sort of square. That is the operator that would give me the second moment of the distribution, right? So. I can do the same thing for the expectation value of t squared. So I can just integrate that, t squared. Now, you'll probably ask yourself, why do I, don't I just square this operator? But actually, if this is not projection valued, then this is not equal to t squared. So these are different things. This is the operator that gives you the second moment of the probability distribution. And this is just the square of some operator. Uh, the, 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 I mean, if you, if you have a projection valued observable, then they would be the same. Then you have the functional calculus that would tell you that's the same, right? But um, but in, for a general observable, it's not. So actually, to 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 do this a little bit more carefully, let me define the domain of T which is the same as the form domain. I don't want to introduce any of this operator t squared, t2, the second moment operator, which is actually simply the set of wave functions so that the, if I take the, this probability measure, this is just a probability measure now, right? And I can ask for those for which the second moment is finite. So it's an application of the Cauchy inequality, that uh, Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. That this is actually a vector space. So this is a this is a dense subset of the Hilbert space, typically, and it's it's where this operator is defined. So actually, on this domain, I'm just telling you now this this kind of operator integral. So for psi, psi in bond t, uh, the integral. This is now a vector value. Let's say, uh, let me uh, write it like this. Uh, f dt psi, I apply these operators to the vector that gives some, some vector. Right? For every small piece of time interval, this gives a vector. And I add them up with a weight t. Right? So, I, so then this is a vector valued integral. Um, so vector valued integral, if you want. Be very precise, say it's a Bochner integral, um, converges strongly in the strong operator topology. This you can show. Actually, Achiza and Glassman claim it's false, but it's actually true. So, um, but anyway, so this this is this is the way you can you can get this this mean operator. And by form domain, I mean that you can look at um, so the variance form of an operator or such an operator looks at the excess at, at the at this difference. So um, so this is for 
uh, let me call that delta. And it has the same form domain, so that is for psi uh, in, in this DOM T. Um, actually, this expression, psi uh, T second norman, that's where this is defined, obviously, yeah? minus um, T psi, T psi, which is like T squared, right? This is actually a positive operation, or a positive quadratic form, right? So this, this expression is always positive. So the difference between the, these, two, the, op, the, these two objects that, that appears when you don't have a projection value of measurement um, is actually positive. And that's what this form, variance form says. I'll discuss that a bit more in a second. So this variance form actually gives us some splitting of the variance that we see in the observed distribution. So the observed distribution is what I call P before, right? So P of some subset of times is a trace of uh, rho f of m, where this is the input density operator. And the variance of this, um, so that's of course like the integral of t squared p dt minus the square of the integral. dt um, has now two terms. And uh, the first is actually something which is linear in rho, which is basically the trace of the variance form. So you could think of this as a contribution from the measurement. And then the second is what you would normally write down as a variance, which is like t squared minus trace rho, so with these brackets, trace rho t squared. You just take the mean arrival time operator for that. And both of these terms are positive. This is positive in the usual way. Right? So, so the, the variance actually decomposes into two contributions. One that comes from, well, you could say this comes from the state somehow, and this comes more from the observer. There's no clean division here, there's no mechanism where you could really add, assign these parts. I'm just saying we have two positive contributions to the variance typically. Okay, but anyway, um, we can call this delta t squared, where this is like as as in uncertainty. Right? So that would be if you if you think of the uncertainty relations now for time and energy, this is the thing that you should put in for the variance of the time. We're talking of preparation uncertainty for um, for arrival time and energy. And then I claim that delta t times delta energy, well, let's say delta Hamiltonian, is larger than h bar over 2. So we have the same usual um, uncertainty relation for arrival time variance and energy variance. Why, why is that true? Um, this is true by dilation. So remember that the arrival time observable really just becomes the, the uh, a projection value of one, like a p observable, and this becomes like a q observable, or the other way around, in the, in the dilated space. The only thing that distinguishes this situation from the situation of p and q, for which this is obviously, tr obviously true, is that you only look at states that are embedded into this larger Hilbert space h hat by means of this isometry. So, this is true by dilation and specializing to states. Two states uh, B rho B star on H hat, right? So if, if you just plug that in, then you see that this is exactly what happens. We have, we have, this is standard position momentum uncertainty, preparation uncertainty, and you're just evaluating it from on a particular set of states, but it's valid, valid for all states, so in particular for those. So 
it's very, very obvious that there is an uncertainty relation here of just the usual kind with a precise interpretation as arrival time variance and energy variance. This has been noted, for example, by Oliver for a long time, for a long time ago. Um, it's a well-known fact. So, so much I wanted to tell you about the covariant approach. Now, but let me say a few words about the, about the problems of this approach. We saw that we cannot really do it with discrete spectrum. So, there's nothing like this for the harmonic oscillator. Then, we also saw that um, well, while you can construct all these guys, it's not so clear how to assign a particular detector that is sitting at some point in space or something like that, how to assign a particular arrival time observable to that. The, the covariant approach, you can, you can use it, you can use an additional symmetry. For example, you can say arrival at the origin should be symmetric under the inversion and maybe have minimal variance, and maybe also should be invariant under time reversal for the free time evolution. Then if you do that, and you minimize the variance, then you get Kiyovsky, right? So, so you can characterize something that is a sort of credible arrival at the origin. Now, but you, you're interested in much more complicated situations. So higher dimension, think of higher dimension, and think of an array of counters that are sitting somewhere in space. So how do I describe the arrival at these guys? That's not, the covariant approach really doesn't help you to do that. So, um, so there's very little flexibility in the modeling here. Um, and we'll solve all these problems at the same time by going to the absorptive approach. And then the next step will be to relate that back and see how we can recover this covariant approach from that. Okay.